All right, welcome back. Here we go. This is our last lecture on North America. It's chapter 15, The Land of Opportunity. This is the third set of slides. So you have, should have already watched two. This is a different one. And this covers the latter part of the chapter from page 363 to 371. Just like I said on the others, watch all the way to the end. Make sure you understand the sources that I did not make all this up by myself. It's um, I got this from other places on the internet. So here we go, North America. Reminder, you can follow along in your book. If you want to follow along in your book, that's great. If you don't, it's not going to cause a problem. Okay, so if you're using the book, this would be the section that starts, The United States Expands West. So, the year is 1803. And the young United States is shown on this map in orange. And um, France needs cash. So um, they offer their ter territory in Central North America, which is called the Louisiana Territory, to the Americans for a bargain price of 15 million of the United States dollars. Um, so it's not math class, and I don't want to get too complicated, but we'll play with the numbers a little bit. We understand that $15 million in 1803 uh, is not the same thing as $15 million today because of something called inflation, which basically means you need more of the physical pieces of money to equal the same value. Um, for example, a gallon of milk is always a gallon of milk. It used to cost like 15 cents and now it costs $4. It's still a gallon of milk, okay? The cost of a thing changes with time, even though the thing doesn't. So $15 million 1803 dollars uh, would be the same thing as $8.5 billion 2020 dollars. Okay, so um, that's still a really good deal. Um, the average cost of just one acre of land in the United States today is $7,000. It's a lot more than that in some places <laughs> and a lot less in others. Um, if we were to try and buy the same amount of land today, it would cost us over a trillion dollars. So Jefferson got a pretty good deal. So anyway, that's 1803. And then in 1846, the United States bought the Oregon Territory from the British, which is on the left side of the map here in green. Um, that added another 250,000 square miles of land to the United States. Um, so you can see all these different territories that are getting added slowly and making your colonies a little bit bigger, or your country, rather. Okay, so your book completely and totally skips over the War of 1812. Um, so because of that, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, which is sad because it's an interesting war. It used to be called, or sometimes it's still called, the Second War for Independence. So this was fought between the Americans and the British, mostly in Canada and along the East Coast. And this was a dispute over... Um, maritime or ocean trading, whether or not we could um, trade with other countries, could the British attack our ships if they were in certain places around the world, things like that. Our national anthem comes from this war. Uh, an American named Francis Scott Key was imprisoned aboard a British ship in the harbor at Baltimore in Maryland, and all night long he listened to the British ships bombarding the American fort on shore, Fort McHenry. And in the morning when he looked out, the American flag was still flying over the fort. And so he wrote the poem that became the Star Spangled Banner. Um, so this picture, very dramatic, probably not 100% accurate. He was, in fact, a prisoner. Um, but anyway, it's a very important war. Nobody ever seems to have, to have time or space for it, uh, and it gets forgotten. But that's too bad. Um, this is the war that kind of got us uh, Florida from the Spanish. A couple other very important things happened during this time period. Uh, it also 100% settled the question of whether or not we would ever be a British colony again, and the answer is definitely a hard no. Okay, <clears throat> now this is where your, your book does focus a lot of time. The Constitution of, of 1787 did allow slavery. Slavery was legal explicitly. That means the text of the Constitution point blank said slavery was okay. So <clears throat> slavery was a critical part of the economy in the very large southern states, and their participation in the Continental Congress was very important. So everything that the Congress agreed on had to be acceptable to those southern states. 
Um, the northern states couldn't have made it on their own, just like the southern states couldn't have made it on their own. It really was an all or nothing thing. Um, and on top of that, in many of the northern states, slavery had been legal, actually, until very close to the time of the revolution. Um, there were quite a few people out there that really didn't think there was much wrong with it, um, even in the North. Um, however, time has passed, right? Now we're getting into the middle, um, or the to middle-ish um, 1800s. And at the same time, the country is growing. The idea of slavery is becoming less and less acceptable. Um, the British have made the slave trade illegal. And popular literature, things like novels and poetry, and religious preaching, um, especially in Protestant churches, were both kind of uniting behind the idea that owning another person was wrong, and the, the African slave trade was this huge modern example that everybody was just kind of ignoring and pretending like it wasn't happening at all. So... Pretty soon, the American South is all of a sudden on a very short list of places where slavery is acceptable, whereas not like 50 years before, it was on a long list of places where slavery was perfectly okay. So the American government needed to find a way to keep slavery from spreading, but not alienate that very important Southern economy. Um, New England's industries were dependent on the raw material that came from the South, and they needed it to be cheap, and that needed slaves, right? Everybody was taking advantage of this system that they all pretended like wasn't, didn't exist. <clears throat> so in 1820, Congress agrees to what is called the Missouri Compromise, the territory that's almost the same space on the map as the modern state, Missouri, wanted to be admitted to the Union. They had the correct number of people and they'd done all the paperwork, um, but they wanted to have slavery be legal. And everybody was very upset by this. Um, so he said, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll draw a line. Um, we'll draw literally a line along a parallel on the map. And north of that latitude, slavery will not be allowed in any new territory. South of that latitude, any new territory can have slavery if they want it. Okay, so Missouri is let in, but after that, this line is going to be the division. So if you sat here and counted, you would see that the slave states and the um, free states um, are balanced. There, it's, it's, um, it gets them balanced because we didn't talk about it, but in the questions you answered, the three parts of the government, executive, judicial, legislative, the legislature is broken into two parts. And the reason they want a balanced number of states, slave and free, is in the Senate, every single state gets the same number of representatives in the Senate. Okay, so that was a way of making sure that really neither side could get the upper hand as long as it stayed perfectly balanced. So the Missouri, buys, a Missouri Compromise buys us some time, which is great because we're about to get into another war and we're gonna need to kick the slavery question down the road a little bit further. So that's what happens. So because you guys live in Texas, you actually have a lot more um, thorough idea of what happened in the Mexican-American War than most people. Okay, so it was fought from 1847, 1848. Um, some, some things happened in 1846, but that was a little bit before. Um, and this is like the second most forgotten war in American history. Um, basically, nobody knows what happened except you guys, because um, it is a very big part of Texas history, but nobody else knows. So basically, the eastern half of Texas, sorry, not the eastern half, the western half of Texas, as you can clearly see on this map, was territory being fought over by both the United States and Mexico. Um, and as you know from last year, right, there's also a bunch of Texians that live here, and um, they have ideas about how it should be as well. So the United States annexed Texas in 1846. Um, you just learned this. It's a little more complicated than that, but many Texans, maybe not most, but many Texans wanted to be part of the United States. President Polk, James K. Polk, was a huge fan of annexation. 
um, because he believed that English-speaking Americans had a destiny to rule the whole continent, that the whole North America should be ruled by one person, and that person needed to be the United States. All right, so this map shows kind of the major battles, the major campaigns of the war, um, the dots and the stars are battles, the blue lines are um, American armies movements. Uh, long story short, the Americans came in more or less by sea and fought battles against Mexican forces that were generally less organized or had inferior equipment. And they weren't easy wins, but they were wins. And in the end, we get the disputed parts of Texas, as well as it won't take very long. And the territory to the west of Texas is also going to be taken from Mexico. So if you're trying to remember all this, don't worry about it. Um, we are rushing through. We are going through this very quickly um, because remember, this is just North America, right? You're going to get all of U.S. history in a couple years. So just sit back. Okay, so you tell me what happens in 1860. All right, yeah. So Abraham Lincoln is elected president as the, of the United States. Okay, 1861 is when the war starts. 1860 is the election of Abraham Lincoln. So he was put forth as a candidate for a relatively new political party called the Republican Party. Um, one of their platform items was that they were anti-slavery, even though Lincoln personally was kind of just meh on slavery um, until after he became president. Um, he didn't think it was great, but he didn't think it was causing too much harm as long as it stayed where it was. Um, and his position was definitely going to shift uh, over the next few years. So the um, presidential election of 1860 was was ugly. It was it was a messy election. There were four major candidates and several other popular, well-known candidates. Lots and lots of men running split the vote very badly. Lincoln only won 39 percent of the vote. OK, that means nearly two thirds of Americans did not want him as president. OK, if you look at just the southern states, the states that will leave and become the Confederacy. OK, in those slave states, he won less than five percent of the vote. And in a couple of those states, he received literally no votes at all. So huge, huge parts of the country have no interest at all in this man being their president, okay? And this is a recipe for disaster. As we all know, the disaster happens, okay? So again, you do not have to follow along in your book. If you are, this would be, I am now at the Civil War, okay? The section that says the Civil War. So <clears throat> at this point, we kind of stop fighting wars against all the other people on our continent. And from now on, um, everything else we do in this chapter becomes, as you can see, the history of the United States. All right, there is still Canada, there is still Mexico, but once the United States grows to a certain size, it's the largest economy, it's the largest population, it becomes the thing, the place, the group, the people that shapes life in on the entire continent and pretty soon the whole hemisphere. Um, so that's the reason your book kind of quits paying attention to other places because this is the most influential group of people operating right now. So if you remember back when we were studying Rome, was there other stuff going on? Uh, yeah, but Rome was the thing that was the most influential for our history. So we focused on it. So that's what's happening now. The United States, because we are, as we know, United Statesians, um, the United States is the most important thing for our history, so that's what we're focusing on. So don't be sad for Canada. If you live there, you'd be studying their history, but we don't, so. Okay, so we're skipping a ton. Don't worry. We are also about to skip a ton just even with the Civil War itself. We cannot possibly cover it all as far as the Civil War. I don't even want to try. I'm not going to do it, all right? So the war was fought from 1861 when the American Navy um, and the Confederate Navy and the Confederates in Charleston, South Carolina, and the American soldiers in Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, four groups of people, start shooting at each other. OK, 
Okay, and the Civil War ends in April 1865 when Robert E. Lee signs the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse in Central Virginia. Okay, so um, this is a, I, this is a pretty good infographic. I like infographics; they're fun. Um, this sums it up. There are 24 free or Union states. Okay, notice that Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, Maryland, those were all originally slave states. Okay, so those are the border states um, that did not join the Confederates. Tennessee was usually considered a border state, even though it's clearly not on the border. Um, they joined the, they did join the Confederates. Okay, um, you can see that Texas, they're a very big state in terms of territory, has joined the Confederacy. Most of the battles in the Civil War take place in the eastern part of the country. So if you look at the pie chart, <clears throat> Seven Days, Gettysburg, Antietam, Wilderness, and Chancellorsville are all fought in Virginia or Maryland. A very small space. Chickamauga, which is the light blue, is fought in southeast Tennessee and in North Georgia. Chickamauga itself is in North Georgia. Um, then the battles around it happened in Tennessee, um, which was A, later in the war, <clears throat> and B, a major Confederate supply point. Okay, so most of the war happens way back east. Um, I chose this graphic because it also allows me to easily talk about basically what happened, like why did the North win? Um, there's a lot of opinions on this, um, but it, it's pretty simple, unfortunately. It's, it's a numbers game. Look at the men available for duty. And as the war goes on, the North has access to more and more um, sources of manpower. Okay, they can get new soldiers all the time. Okay, um, because every year, this is not the same soldiers plus. This is how many new ones are available. Okay, and if you look at what happens in the South, yeah, their numbers go up a little bit, but then they start to go down. The South never had as many adult men and then they have fewer and fewer of them and no way to replace them. Where in the North, you have a larger population and you have immigration and you have a draft. Um, the South is not able to get that many people <clears throat> in uniform. So at the end of the war, among many other results, slavery was illegalized and the structure of the federal government was strengthened. Okay, so the idea of union is much stronger than it had been before the war and um, and you also have a clearer idea of how the states relate to one another and to the federal government. Um, putting it bluntly, they lose a lot of power, okay, whether they ever had it or whether it just kind of becomes clear where the limits were, where the lines were drawn on their power and the federal government's power. They're less independent after the Civil War. Okay. Um, this is a complicated time period from the end of the Civil War to like 1900. Um, the southern part of the United States is in really bad shape for a long time. Um, we're kind of going to skip that for right now. Um, slowly, continuously, improvements in technology are making their way across the ocean. They're making their way to North America. And the ability for people to buy and sell things gets easier and easier because it gets cheaper and faster to produce them. Okay, we call this the Industrial Revolution. It's a very important moment of change. One of the most significant things is that cities grow, and um, by, by 1900, more people live in cities in the United States than live out in the country in the United States, which is a complete change from the time of the Civil War and before that, okay? So families are changing their way of life, sometimes um, not just the father, but the mother and the children as well, like in this picture, are working. They're working in factories or, or wherever. Um, people are moving west. There's growth. Okay. Um, so by 1900, the South is still behind, but everyone is, is more nearly on the same page. You do have industries in the South. You do have industries in the North. You do have things growing out West as well. You have the railroads, things like this. Um, in the South, we have some problems with laws, right? Which are discriminating against black people or other minorities from really in, fully enjoying the freedom 
which had been bought for them during the Civil War. Um, we're going to come back to that a little bit because we're going more or less in order. But um, right now, we're going to keep going with the 1900s. Okay, so the late 1800s is the Industrial Revolution. So think of railroads and steel mills and the cities growing. Okay, after 1900, lots of things happen. <laughs> But we're just going to pick three events that are really, really major. Um, the first one is World War One. Okay, it's a four-year war. We were only involved really for the last year, last 18 months of it. Okay, so this creates or this forces the United States to adjust the way it's related to all the other countries in the world, where we kind of were by ourselves on our continent doing our own thing. Now we have to start thinking more carefully about do we have treaties with other countries? Do we join things like um, the League of Nations, which is before the UN? And all these kinds of questions that we had thought about but hadn't needed to make a decision before. So those become very important. And then in 1929, the stock market crashes and the Great Depression begins. Okay. So this is also very, very formative. This changes the structure of our government even more dramatically than the Civil War did. Okay, the federal government grows hugely and starts to have a much more personal role in each individual person's life. Um, lots of government programs which are meant to protect people, okay, and cause the government to become very, very large are started at this time. Um, things we call them regulatory agencies or executive agencies, things like the Department of Commerce, or not the Department of Commerce, oh my gosh, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Agriculture, all these things either are started or grow hugely during this time. And the government's able to have a lot more um, detailed impact on everybody's life. And then from 1941 to 1945, there's World War II. Okay, and this is another big moment where we try to figure out, okay, how do we relate to all the other countries around the world? Um, again, travel is faster, travel is cheaper, everybody is a little bit more connected than they were, and how does our country fit into that? So, um, that brings us to basically to the end of your chapter. Um, after World War II, the United States um, has to deal with being um, in this interconnected world. And it's a lot more difficult to separate our study of history in the different regions, okay? So you may, might have noticed this in your book in other chapters. Once we got to around 1950 or something in China and Japan, the other places we've read about, no matter where you're studying, you kind of end up studying the whole world, okay? So our culture has become defined by politics or sports or bad haircuts <laughs> or um, things like that. Instead of um, in the Middle Ages, um, by religion or art or things like that. Okay, so this is a feature of our modern world. Everything moves very quickly. Um, so that's the end of your chapter, right? It does talk about law, about equality, about the values upon which the country was founded, and how our history um, measures up to that standard over the years. And that's the end of the chapter. I actually don't have sources on here for you. I realize they're the same as the other two um, videos, but they're not. This is the last slide. So, um, so think about all of this. You've already answered almost all of you have already answered your questions. So good job. And we'll do Central America next, and then and then next week we'll get into South America. And that's the end of your book. We're going to be done. So good job. Thank you for watching. Try to keep it. Um, short and sweet for you, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.